I, I, I did just want to hear what your your parting message to leaders who attended this summit would be um, now that they've gone home. What do they still need to be thinking about and what do you want them to be doing next? I think my main message would really be that the time for action is now and the time for building on the friendships and the collaborations made at that conference is now to make sure that we have the impact we all want on tigers, on nature and on people. So we've set the ambition and let's go get it. Welcome to Nature Breaking, a World Wildlife Fund podcast focused on the news and trends affecting our natural world and the people and species who call it home. I'm Seth Larson, and today we're revisiting a topic that we first covered in 2022, tiger conservation. Back then, we were celebrating the fact that global wild tiger numbers had rebounded from a low of 3,200 in 2010 to about 4,500. And since then, we've seen continued progress. The most recent available estimate found that there are now over 5,500 tigers roaming the wild. But as we've talked about before on Nature Breaking, efforts to conserve species don't just end because of a few good progress reports. So what are the most important steps we can take to keep tiger populations trending upward? Well, that was the topic of the recent Sustainable Financing for Tiger Landscapes conference in Bhutan. As the title suggests, one of the biggest hurdles facing tiger conservation is funding. Simply put, countries with wild tigers need more reliable, long-term sources of funding to continue implementing conservation measures at the scale required. Joining me today to talk more about this is Jenny Roberts, Director of Development and Communications for WWF's Tigers Alive initiative. Jenny is going to walk us through the biggest challenges facing wild tigers today and explain how more financing could help to unlock even bigger results. YouTube viewers will see that I spoke with Jenny from my makeshift home studio because since she's based in Uganda and I'm on the east coast of the U.S., the time difference meant it was easier to record this one outside of normal office hours. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you prefer to hear or see us. And now, here's my conversation with Jenny. Okay, I'm joined now by Jenny Roberts, Director of Development and Communications for WWF's Tigers Alive Initiative. Jenny, welcome to Nature Breaking. Thanks, Seth. Yeah, really excited to be here. Yeah, so I want to start with the basics, and I wanted to just ask you to take a moment to remind our listeners about the current state of the world's tigers. Uh, I'm thinking, how many countries do tigers live in? Where are those countries? And how many tigers are left in the wild today? Yeah, very important question. So there's 5,500 tigers in the wild today. That's the latest estimate. And that's across 10 countries in Asia, all the way from South Asia, Southeast Asia, and then even as far east as China and Russia. But to put that into context a little bit, um, at the beginning of the 20th century, so in like the 1900s, there was 100,000 tigers. Mm -hmm. So that's been a huge decline. And Although there's been a recent turning point, so in 2016, tiger numbers for the first time ever stopped going down and actually started to increase after a lot of concerted conservation effort and investment by by loads of different partners. Um, so it's really exciting. It's really hopeful. Um, but the progress is not even. Tigers are going up in some areas and some sites, but in other countries continuing to decline and even been made extinct in three countries in the last 20 years. So they're losing range. The number of places where we find tigers today continues to decline all the time. Um, they're left with just 8% of the places where they used to be found. Um, so it went from oh, wow. over a billion hectares once upon a time to just 8% of that today. And it used to once range from Korea, all the way across to Kazakhstan, so across the, the whole suite of Asian ecosystems. So, yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit more in a few minutes about that m more recent progress, but um, obviously still far below the number of tigers that we saw in the wild 100 plus years ago. And I wanted to tease out a little more what caused tiger populations to dwindle so low. I think a lot of us could make educated guesses, but can you just give us an informed readout of what threats tigers have faced historically and what threats they continue to face today. Yeah, and a lot of those threats are kind of the same, but maybe shifting in importance. Um, but there's two main mm -hmm. areas where tigers have been threatened. So the first is around their habitat and their home, and the second is around sort of targeted killing of tigers. So 
In the first area in habitat loss, um, that's been for a whole range of reasons that we've seen across biodiversity in general, I'd say from agriculture development, land use change, um, infrastructure such as roads and rails, which has meant not just the loss of habitat areas, but also fragmenting those spaces, which for a landscape scale species mm. like tigers that need to move across vast areas, it can have really dire consequences. Um, so that was historically the biggest threat. It's, pr it's still a threat today, but the land use change is not happening quite at the same scale um, as it was. The targeted killing of tigers is really the most critical threat that continues today. And the primary reason for that is to feed the illegal wildlife trade and demand for tiger parts and products, um, primarily in uh, countries like Vietnam and China, um, for a range of different reasons, from status symbols to presumed medicinal values. But there's another reason also for the targeted killing of tigers, which is retaliation from human wildlife conflict incidences, mm. places where people and tigers interact it can often lead to livestock loss such as someone's cow being killed and that can be a, an economic a big economic impact on local communities and so people yeah. retaliate if there's not uh, good management of conflict in place and good support for those people um, to keep the people and the tigers safe yeah i think it's important to remember that you know for so many of us you know in the u.s and in many parts of the world where tigers are not a native species that we, we never would think of seeing a tiger in the wild. We think of tigers as these beautiful exotic creatures. Um, they're very inspirational. And we might think like, why would anyone ever want to hurt a tiger? But if you're a, a small holder, small scale farmer, and a tiger roams through your property and kills your livestock, then you may have a very different perspective. And um, and, and different rationales for how you might act in response to that. So I think that's something really important for all of us to think about. And I know one of the really important tactics that we'll get to in a little bit is some of the work that countries and conservationists have been doing to minimize those conflicts between tigers and people. Just to um, say, on there's some so, some parallels that can be drawn. I think even within the U.S. and Europe around wolves, for instance, you know, bringing back wolves to Yellowstone, mm. a lot of those same kind of conflicts happen at a different scale, maybe, but they're still there. So I think, I mean, human wildlife conflict has been an issue since since we came about, since we started interacting with them. It's it's just yeah. at which scale, intensity, and trying to manage that. Yeah. Yeah. No, well said. That's a great example. Um, so as, as we've touched on a little bit, and as I mentioned in my intro, wild tigers reached their low point of about 3,200 in 2010. And you mentioned that the, and in 2016, we finally hit a threshold where their numbers stopped going down and sort of uh, flatlined, and they've been going up since then, which is great. And I think I just want to talk a little bit about how that came about and what was done to create that turnaround. And I know one of the things that happened in 2010 when we did reach that historic low was there was a big conference in St. Petersburg where leaders from countries and conservation groups and other stakeholders came together and set a really ambitious goal of doubling the number of wild tigers by 2022. And we're about at 5,500 or a little more than that now. So we're getting close to that doubling target uh, a couple of years after the, the initial goal was set to be reached, but uh, really good progress. And I, I want to just ask you to talk a little bit more about what tactics have been working and what was done in the wake of that 2010 summit that really made a difference. Thanks, Seth. Yeah, that 2010 summit was a real landmark moment for tiger conservation. It got the attention of leadership, heads of state, um, minister level representation to a a really specific and measurable goal for a species, which is very rare, and particularly a species as high profile as a tiger. Um, and the goal itself of doubling tigers was a real mindset shift for conservationists. It was ahead of the nature positive trend, stopping to look at saving tigers from extinction and really focusing on a much more ambitious and hopeful future about restoration and recovery. And it's that shift that was really important, I think, in, in transformational change and not just business as usual. The other thing about the measurable goal was that we started to hold countries accountable then to something that was much more specific. Countries started counting tigers better and investing in counting tigers. Yeah. 
And as soon as you know where tigers are and how many there are and how they're doing, we can start to make much more informed decisions about what to do with our really limited conservation funding. So that was so important. Um, another really key area that happened in some places is really investing in genuine partnerships with indigenous peoples and local communities. There's a place in Malaysia called Balum Temenggor on the border with Thailand, where our office there, WF Malaysia, has more than a decade of investment in a community, a Jahai indigenous community there, and building up local community patrol teams. And this kind of enabling and helping them be stewards of their own forest has led to a reduction of 98% in the number of tiger traps that we found in the forest there. And it's starting to build a more hopeful wow. future um, for the tigers in that space. And it's because of the commitment and the partnership we have with those, with those people living in the spaces with tigers. And finally, and really importantly, I wanted to say that after 2010, there was also because of the leadership um, attention on tiger conservation, there was a real investment in protected areas both existing ones and also establishing new ones. So in India, they increased investment in some areas where they found when they counted tigers, they found there was more than they thought. So they started putting more investment in their place called Pilibit Tiger Reserve in the North is a good example of that. Um, the Chinese government set up the largest tiger protected area in the world called the Northeast China Tiger and Leopard National Park. Um, and in places like Nepal and Bhutan, they just started um, professionalizing their ranger force, providing them with technology, institutionalizing ranger training so that like firemen and police, there was a really standard effective training for them that everyone went through. It was you know, a professional workforce more so than it had been seen in the past. And that has really sustainable sort of impact on a, on a workforce basically that's, that's responsible for protecting really key areas, not just for tigers, but for biodiversity, for nature protection and all the services and, and resources they provide. So if I can just kind of summarize all of that, it seems like the things that have really been working are, uh, in no particular order, getting leadership level buy-in from these countries where tigers are present, um, working with those leaders to either create new protected areas or to double down on the work that happens to keep protected areas secured and effective to, to provide habitat for tigers, and working with indigenous people and local communities whose uh, homes are in in these tiger ranges and who have these incidents or are, are most likely to have these incidents of human tiger conflict to help them either prevent those conflicts to begin with through various tactics or to uh, find different ways of responding beyond just killing tigers uh, and, and figuring out different interventions that can be beneficial for both those people and their properties and their families and also for tigers and, and their populations. Is that about yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a great summary, Seth. Great. So that kind of brings us up to speed on all the really amazing work that's been done over the last decade plus to conserve tigers. And I want to turn now to this most recent summit in Bhutan that really was the impetus for me wanting to talk to you today. Um, first of all, why was the summit held in Bhutan and um, did you have a chance to attend? Yes, I was there. It was an incredible event. <laughs> Great. So it, why, why was Bhutan chosen as the host country for this summit? Bhutan is an incredibly unique place, and it's really at the forefront of conservation. It's, um, it's a leader in this space, and so it made complete sense to be there. It's got more than 50% of its country is protected areas. Not only that, it's the only country where the entire protected area system it's connected through identified corridors for wildlife. Um, it's also mm. carbon negative, meaning it absorbs more carbon than it releases. Um, yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> and so because, and the reason for all of this success is really grounded in its its leadership and its consistent leadership on, on multiple levels. Um, as I think Carter Roberts, the CEO of WF US, put it in the opening, there's an abundance of this kind of leadership in Bhutan. Um, Her Majesty the Queen of Bhutan, generously offered her patronage for this conference, which really created the level of convening power that led us to be able to attract 10 Tiger Range country governments to rep to be represented there, leadership from banks such as the Asian Development Bank um, and other multilaterals and funding bodies such as the Global Environment Facility. So it was really that convening power that the leadership brought. Also, not only the palace, but also His Excellency, the Prime Minister of Bhutan, uh, Dasho Sering Topge, he's a 
visionary conservationist and was instrumental in forming what um, was the first conservation uh, project finance for permanence project in Asia, which is called Bhutan for Life. So this is a yeah, this is a an innovative financing system that was set up to ensure sustainable resources for Bhutan's protected area system. And it does so through a kind of sinking grant fund. So over time, the amount of grant funding decreases and and over time, the government increases its investment. And we and the grant funding sort of supports the government to to be able to reach those commitments of increased investment in its protected areas. So it's really about sustaining um, protection of these areas into the the far, far long term future. Um, So those are the main reasons. I mean, the Bhutan for life, it's not only the the innovative financing that it is, which is a real champion of what we were trying to bring at this conference, but also the impact it's already having. We've seen a 27% increase in tiger population in Bhutan since Bhutan for Life started, um, more than 39% increase in snow leopards, and also an increase in carbon sequestration, over a million tons of carbon being sequestered in addition to what was already there before. So it's that level of impact from the sustainable financing that's a real kind of proof of concept for this to sort of spearhead this conference. Yeah, that's amazing. I feel like we probably can and should do a whole episode on Bhutan for Life at some point on this show because um, we've talked about PFPs in, in other episodes here and there, um, and they're really impressive and, and interesting ways to approach conservation financing. Um, and Bhutan for Life is really just an, an outstanding example of a, a place that's really gone above and beyond to implement that initiative and to um, to turn out some really amazing outcomes. Um, so that absolutely makes sense about why Bhutan was the setting for this meeting. And I want to ask a little more about the meeting. And first of all, why was why was the meeting needed? You know, I, I know in 2010, when the last really major global tiger summit happened in St. Petersburg, it aligned with this nadir of tigers hitting a low point globally, which I'm sure was a motivating factor for bringing people together. What was the motivation this time and what was the goal going into the conference? So the the 2010 goal was set on these kind of year of the tiger cycles, which is every 12 years we have a year of the tiger. Yeah. And the last year of the tiger in 2022, we kind of did a reflection and look back how things had gone. We were obviously very hopeful by the progress we'd made. But the biggest thing that we found as a collection of NGOs, but also a intergovernmental organization called the Global Tiger Forum, what we all found was that there was a real lack in financing to secure this kind of progress into the future, to build on the foundation which we had started. And the gap which we were starting to see was about $100 million a year was sort of lacking in tiger conservation funding for particularly for protected areas. So a huge amount. And over 10 years, that would be a billion dollars. So we knew we, need to, we needed to convene and we needed to collaborate to get after something at this scale. So that was the second thing that was needed, more collaboration. And this conference was really targeting a diversity of different leadership across different sectors. And that's what we really strive to achieve. We wanted the private sector there. We wanted public sector financing there. We wanted the range state governments there. Um, and the NGOs and all kind of interested parties, but with really different expertise to kind of go after this problem together um, and see how we could use our kind of collective interest in the impact um, and our expertise to to kind of leverage each other's opportunities. Great. And I want to ask you about what was achieved there in a minute. But first, since you actually had a chance to be there in person, I'd love for you to just paint a little bit of a picture of what the experience was like at this summit, where... You know, where where was it? I think you mentioned the, the, the palace earlier um, and who was there and what kind of conversations were happening? Were there a lot of speeches on a, from a stage uh, and, and an audience listening? Was it a little more interactive, maybe a mix of both? I'm, I'm just curious if you can give our audience sort of a feel for what it was like on the ground there. Yeah, it, uh, thank you for asking, because it was really not a conference like anything else. Uh, we've had the words used such as a fairy tale moment and things like that, particularly having <laughs> Her Majesty the Queen there um, opening the ceremony. So there was an inaugural ceremony where we had um, a huge silk tapestry laid out that is only presented once or twice a year um, down an entire building. Oh, wow. um, we had... Um, 
this amazing venue, which was called Pangbisa Zong. So it was the inaugural event at this incredible institution that the king had uh, envisaged and has been built over the last 10 years. So it was this beautiful, oh, wow. new but historic looking venue on the side of a mountain at 3,000 uh, meters up. And wow. <laughs> Uh, with the clouds kind of rolling in in the morning as we arrived and all the Tiger Range country flags flying. And Her Majesty opened the event with a traditional Bhutanese ceremony with dancers. Um, we had artists also speaking at the event about the cultural significance of tigers. So it really was beyond the financing. We were there to talk about the money, but everyone was also there with a united passion and seeing the kind of intrinsic value that this species has as well, which was beautiful. There was an art exhibition. And the meeting closed with a group photo with the entire leadership of the country, His Majesty the King, Her Majesty the Queen, and the Prime Minister, this incredible group photo, showing our commitment to to the conference ambition. So it was really awe-inspiring, and I'm going to carry that with me <laughs> forever, I think. Yeah, that sounds incredibly inspirational and definitely a great platform to launch uh, sort of the next decade plus of tiger conservation and and achievements so in that beautiful setting, what was what was achieved? What were the outcomes from this summit in Bhutan and what was agreed to? Yeah, so the main outcome of this conference was summarized in what's been called and what was read at the closing, the Paris Statement for Tigers. And it's a commitment to mobilizing an additional one billion US dollars for tigers and tiger landscapes over the next 10 years. And that was a commitment okay. made by the royal government of Bhutan with the support and collaboration of the Tiger Conservation Coalition. And I want to talk a little bit more about the coalition because it, it's sort of one of the main pre-outcomes of this conference, um, which is a coalition that was established in the year of the Tiger, 2022. Um, of 10 different mm -hmm. organizations, both NGOs, but also intergovernmental um, organizations such as UNDP and IUCN, but it includes WF and WF was a real driving force behind its creation. Um, we wanted to bring a united front to the new challenges facing tigers today. And it was something that didn't, that wasn't there before. There had been quite a lot of territory as there often is in the NGO space around sort of tiger conservation. And we've seen a real shift yeah. Uh, ahead of this conference, and it was the co-organizer of the conference was this coalition and a real team effort between these 10 different organizations to put this event on. So that collaboration has also laid the foundation that will sort of enable the success of this mobilization of a billion dollars as well. Yeah, thank you for calling that out. I think it may feel like a little bit of an inside baseball thing for people who are not in the conservation space professionally, but this notion of different conservation groups that are working in this space coming together and setting aside silos and working together to achieve outcomes at a, uh, a really global scale, I, I know is super important. I mean, it's important in every area of conservation work, but I know historically tigers in particular had been seen as this area where there was just a lot of competition between NGOs who all had good intentions and were trying to do good things, but may uh, be pursuing one initiative in one country while another organization is pursuing a different initiative in a different country and maybe not using necessarily the same tactics or understanding how there might be interplay and um, and bringing those groups together and and setting a, a shared vision and strategy going forward. It, it, I know in the conservation community is something that people are really, really excited about and are feeling like is going to make a big difference going forward. Um, and in terms of the $1 billion goal for the next 10 years, am I right that that's basically, you, you mentioned before that there had been a shortfall of about $100 million annually that was identified that was needed to really achieve tiger conservation at the scale required. And so the $1 billion goal is basically stretching out that shortfall over 10 years to arrive at, at that billion dollar goal. And that's that's how that was arrived at, right? Yes, yeah, that's right, exactly. Great. So tell me a little more about how this billion dollar financing goal is gonna work. How will that money get raised? How will it get distributed? And what kinds of activities would it potentially support? Thanks, Seth. Yeah, that's the real meat of the question and the conference really, isn't it? Um, 
the key thing to say here is that it's not one mechanism and not one solution. We're looking at how we can build on what we already need, which is the kind of grant-based funding, which we've been relying on as tiger conservation. But we really wanted to challenge ourselves and our partners in how we can think differently about how we can leverage that grant-based funding to get more sort of investments at scale. And to do that, we need sometimes some sort mm -hmm. of different um, mechanisms and structures, such as debt instruments like bonds or credits and things like that to to, I guess, unlock a different level of financing that can be more sustainable and really importantly, create more benefits for the people who are living in these tiger landscapes and sharing space with them to ensure that they're supportive and they're stewards of tiger conservation themselves. So that's a really big part of this of this financing is ensuring that kind of equitable sharing and, and real focus on the people living in these spaces in these 63 uh, tiger landscapes. The kind of activities that would be implemented if we're talking about like really groundwork that would be done with this $1 billion. It's it's a lot of the core tiger conservation work that I talked about before around protected area management, um, managing conflict well to keep people safe, livestock safe, and also tigers safe. So that interface between people and tigers in the landscape and making sure that we're preventing, mitigating, and managing that conflict well um, to make sure it's a good relationship. We're also looking at how we maintain and build connectivity between those core spaces where there are tigers. So the corridors where tigers need to move between, making sure that they are protective and the people living in those corridors are supportive of the tigers moving through there. Um, that's not only important for current tiger populations, but a big part of this ambition is also looking at the places where tigers could recover range. So there's spaces where tigers could move back into um, naturally on their own if we build back those corridors uh, and secure those spaces. And the other key part of this is that the trade angle I talked about and ensuring that some of this money goes into tackling that trade um, at the landscape scale. Okay, that's great. So it sounds like it was a really inspiring conference. It sounds like a lot was accomplished and a lot was agreed to, but the devil is going to be in the implementation, right? Uh, so you just talked about how the funds would be used if we can raise them and, and all of that, but... We still have a lot of work to do both to raise the money and to develop plans to, to actually make sure it gets put to good use. And I don't mean we WWF, I mean we as a conservation community writ large and with national leaders and, and everyone involved. So I wanted to just ask as a, as a parting question, what is next coming out of this conference? What needs to happen next? And if you could send one message to the leaders who attended the summit but who've now gone home but who still need to take actions in the wake of the summit, what would your message to them be? So I think firstly on what needs to happen next, I would say there's a few different things which are already sort of driving ahead. I think the first is some of these mechanisms which we discussed at the conference are being developed with collaboration, with different expertise involved. So these funds that I was talking about, there's one called the Tiger Landscape Investment Fund that's a bit more further along, mm -hmm. which UNDP is developing with the support of the coalition. So we're looking at how we can really bring that to fruition, make it realizable, make sure it has um, decision making of tiger conservationists and indigenous peoples and local communities in the design phase and development phase all the way through to implementation. So we're looking at all those things and how we make sure we get it right um, by getting a lot of partners in the room. Um, Great. And that's for not only tigers. I'm, we, it's important we talk about the multitude of co-benefits this financing is for. It's going to have impacts on the 100 million plus people that rely on services and resources in tiger landscapes. It's going to have impacts for carbon storage and sequestration, um, water quality as well, which is really key in a lot of these landscapes. They protect a lot of watersheds. Yeah, I know. I know that's a really important part of the argument that we were making going into this summit and that we as a conservation community try to make around tiger conservation more broadly that it's not just about saving tigers and it's not just about protecting the people who live in areas that could be in conflict with tigers. When we protect a tiger landscape, then you're protecting lots of other biodiversity in that same landscape. You're keeping carbon in the ground by um, keeping trees and, and other landscapes intact. And there's just a whole range of knock-on benefits, water water filtration and the like that, that accrue when you conserve a tiger landscape which does have the nice benefit of helping tigers, but has all those other benefits as well. Um, 
So sorry to cut you off. I, I, I did just want to hear what your your parting message to leaders who attended this summit would be um, now that they've gone home. What do they still need to be thinking about and what do you want them to be doing next? I think my main message would really be that the time for action is now and the time for building on the friendships and the collaborations made at that conference is now to make sure that we have the impact we all want on tigers, on nature and on people. So we've set the ambition and let's go get it. Fantastic. Well, very well said, very succinctly said. Uh, Jenny, I really appreciate you taking the time to bring us up to speed on this really amazing, inspirational summit that happened in Bhutan. It seems like a lot of momentum is coming out of that meeting, and I can't wait to see what happens next. So thank you very much. Thanks, Seth. Great to be with you today. Okay, that's a wrap for today. Thanks again to Jenny for sharing her takeaways from the Sustainable Financing for Tiger Landscapes Conference in Bhutan and for helping us understand what it's going to take to keep wild tigers thriving in the years ahead. I think just about everyone feels a sense of awe and inspiration when we see images of tigers living their best lives in the wild, and I'm grateful to know that people like Jenny and so many others are dedicated to helping them do just that. For now, have a great day, and let's keep building a more sustainable future.